So, Matush, welcome, welcome to, to C++ again, I have to say, because you've been there before. This is your second time. And this time, I have to admit, I really like your topic. That This is not about the last time, of course, but I really <laughs> like that you're not talking about features or C20 in particular, but that you've chosen to talk about software design. And so I'm really looking forward to this talk, and I'm looking forward to learn more about why software engineering is about trade-offs. Okay, uh, thank you, Klaus. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I hope that I will be able to uh, actually uh, right now deliver the talk according to Klaus' expectations, <laughs> because he already uh, makes some pressure on me <laughs> because of my of the subject of my talk. Uh, yeah, today I um, decided to share with you uh, some mm, maybe pains of of the. Uh, software engineering and the design process than an every architect has to do during the design of some features, libraries, uh, frameworks, and so on. Um, so we are going to talk about the art of the software design. And um, at the very beginning, we'll talk briefly about the uh, subject by itself. After that, we are going to have some example from the standard library. And then I will um, switch to the library I'm right now designing, the physical units library. And that actually maybe will become a part of C26 in the future. At least this is our hopes. But uh, um, if, if not, if it will be still on the GitHub and many users and, and and companies already use it and are happy from it. So let's talk about the software design at the very beginning. I consider problem solving a really hard part. Uh, if I talk to different people, different customers, um, different maybe uh, even for the same customer like a company, depending on the position the current person holds, his point of view is different. And this is a big problem when you are trying to architect, when you try to design a solution that will make everyone everyone's happy, right? Um, architects will have different point of view. Uh, engineers will have different point of view. Management will have different point of view. And all of them will provide different requirements. Um, the uh, good architect, good solution architect uh, um, should actually go to every stakeholder, to every group of stakeholders, gather the requirements, and try to address them to make everyone happy, right? But but sometimes it's really hard. And we are going to talk about uh, making everyone happy today. Being an architect is also being able to see the whole picture. Sometimes, um, people, uh, engineers, but also customers that request features see very specific point of the of the project of the of the product they want to um, develop that you want to get they want to receive from you, for example, right? But it turns out that that um, if you look at the whole picture, um, you may see some problems, some issues, uh, something that, that that basically will be a, a compromise uh, in the solution. So, for example, like in this picture, you can design the best architecture on top of, of, of the user interface, but still, if it's if it lays down on something really uh, old or legacy, or maybe or maybe really really narrow and 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 and, and maybe fragile, and uh, then everything can break easily, right? So, uh, as an architect, you should always think about the whole picture. Uh, try to understand it, try to get the information from all of the stakeholders um, to understand how an entire product, entire solution looks like. It's often not that easy because in many cases there is no documentation uh, of the product that will actually present the whole picture to you, right? So you have to talk with everyone and try to understand how it works and, and create this mental picture of the entire product in your head. And even if you have all of the requirements, you see entire picture, it's still maybe really hard to provide some, some um, solutions. Uh, 
sometimes, and we'll discuss this today, there are solutions that basically do not address all of the features, do not address all of the all of the requirements, do not address all of the uh, requests from the customer. There is no golden bullet. There are solutions that address some of them and some uh, other solutions that, uh, that address another part of requirements, but there is none that address all of them. And this is the hardest part. When you actually the, the part to actually design and 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 basically to uh, to implement the solution is not that big, but you have to spend a lot of time to this to decide which of the solutions should be provided because because none of them is perfect, and there is sometimes not possible to provide a perfect solution for some cases. So today. We are going to make some design trade-offs. And during the rest of our talk, we are going to put ourselves in the product architect's shoes. I will show you three uh, different problems, and you will try to uh, basically uh, find or choose the best solution that you think is right. Uh, we are going to run some polls uh, on, on Twitch, and, and, and those polls will will, will allow you to um, make choices and also provide feedback for me and, and for others. What is the best solution in your opinion? Let's start with the um, standard library example. Here we're having some library. The library has uh, established connection function that basically takes the list of ports, uh, a range of ports from the first port to the last port, and those ports has to be established uh, on the network. And this function can fail, it can throw an exception. And, and here is the range for our example application from 1 to 20, so we want to set up some 20 connections, right? It may fail, so we are catching the exception and sending then basically something unhandled was, was, uh, was caught here because at this point, we don't know how to handle the, uh, the error. Connection, in our case, is really simple. It just gets the port in the constructor and, and stores it in, inside the class, returns it as a member, and unfortunately, during the construction, from time to time, when shit happens, uh, an exception can be thrown, right? Network is down, cable is unplugged, um, I don't know, the, the bandwidth is, 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 uh, is taken and, and, and so on. Database is broken. Um, and a and, and solution that basically um, may happen in the real world. We are going to have a vector of those connections. And let's see how our established connections function may look like. Let's assume that, that we want to try 10 times to set up all of the connections. So while connections are empty, or uh, the last connection is different from the last provided by the user, we are going to try to set up connections. We are going to, um, to, to, to do some um, try to set up them. And if the error happens, we will we will going to, to make a retry until uh, the counter is down to zero. So. The first part is really easy, right? We are doing a loop and we are adding current connection. First is in, in, in increased here, so with every connection that succeeds, that succeeds, we are starting from the next port to be, to be open and connected. If the error happens, we are decrementing retry, retry number. If it's bigger than zero, then we are basically logging out that we had some error happened and we are retrying. Otherwise, we are saying that the counter is down to zero, and we failed to set up all of, all of the connections, and we are referring the exception to the outer scope. And with this implementation, add connection is really simple. This is the entire implementation. Connections and playback port. This is possible because the standard library provides us so-called strong exception safety guarantee. And we don't have to care what happens with our database of connections when the exception is being thrown. 
So here comes the question. How often do you analyze exception safety of your code? When was the last time you reviewed the exception safety of your algorithm? How often do you analyze exception safety of your custom written class assignment operator? Or which exception safety the latest library utility you written uh, provides? Did you ask these questions to you? To yourself after writing some code? Let's maybe talk about exception safety guarantees. We have four of them. We have no throw or no fail exception guarantee that says that basically the exception cannot happen. These are mostly no accept functions, right? If exception even is thrown inside, the to terminate will be will be will, will, will be run. So the exception will never leak outside of this function. Uh, on the other hand, on the other side, we have no exception guarantee, which means that basically we don't provide any exception guarantees. If exception happens, everything can happen. Only in this case, uh, the function uh, basically or the program may be, may uh, become in an invalid state. There may be some resource leaks, some memory corruption, or maybe something really bad can happen. Between those two, we have two other exception safety guarantees, strong and basic one. Strong exception safety guarantee means basically that uh, if an exception happens during the invocation of some function, uh, the state of the application is like this function was never called. Like, so basically, if you did some uh, side effects, some changes inside this function already until the exception is being thrown, all of those changes has to be undid, right? Like the undo operation in your editor. It has to, it has to control Z, all of, the, all of the changes you did in this function, and return the state to the user like this function was never called. And this is why our previous add connection function was so nice. If the exception is being thrown during creating of a new connection, vector, our database of connections, will be, will be preserved in the state like this function was never called. We don't have to care about cleaning up the database. Basic exception safety guarantee, on the other hand, is the solution where a program still is in a valid state. It's well defined, well documented how the state looks like, but you, but you are forced to do some manual cleanup actions in order to uh, continue execution of the application. From my experience working as a trainer, as a consultant with many customers, uh, even if the customer, even if the programmers theoretically know exception safety guarantees, uh, they often ignore this in the production code. This is why I ask you, you those three questions about exception safety code, what, right? When was the last time you analyzed what you wrote? What is the exception safety of the part of the program you just provided? Do you ask those questions to you? This is really important. Let's imagine that the standard library uh, didn't provide this exception safety guarantee that it only provides basic exception safety guarantee, not the strong one. And in such case, our add connection function could look like this one. Right? If there are any connections, you have to check if last employee separation failed. We are checking what's the last iterator in our connections database. If it's dirty, so basically it didn't succeed, we have to erase this duty element. And only then, we can emplace a new one. This is one of the possibilities to provide basic exception safety guarantee. You have to always check if your database, your application, your, your utility is in a um, consistent state, in a well-defined state, in a state that allows you to continue execution. If not, you have to make a cleanup that's well-defined by a specific feature. Fortunately, most of the standard library provides strong exception safety guarantee to us, so we don't think about it. We don't have to think about it at least for the code that um, touches C++ standard library. But a lot of code that we write 
actually doesn't provide those guarantees and we have to think about it. We have to document this, this for the user, first of all, so the user knows what to do. And the user, on the other hand, has to make those actions while uh, the, um, the, ex the exception handling uh, is being done. I said most of the standard library because there are some exceptions from this rule. One of them, and I think the most important one that I know, is variant. This is copy paste from cppreference.com, and variant in standard library has so called valueless by exception state. It means that basically variant is a union of alternatives, right? And, and it's never empty, it cannot be empty by itself. Uh, empty is an invalid state. But sometimes it can get into this valueless by exception state, which is exceptional. It is only possible to get to it when exception happens. So how can it happen? Let's imagine that you have a class A as cl and class B as alternatives of a variant. Uh, the variant by default is, is constructed with the first alternative. So let's say with A, right? And then you want to switch the variant to B. When you're switching variant to B, First of all, you have to destruct A, right? To make a space for B. So you don't no longer have A. Next, you are trying to construct B. And in during construction of B, an exception will happen. You end up in the, let's say, undefined state, right? You cannot return A to the user because it's already destructed. You cannot return a variant with B because the construction failed. And you end up in this value by exception state. This is basic exception safety guarantee. You end up with something that's uh, basically in a defined state, but the state is requires some cleanup. This variant is not uh, ready to use in a production code in the rest of the application. Let's see some example. Let's assume that our uh, database, our, our connection engine uh, has some sockets. It may have a basic socket, and it may be some fast socket. Maybe something, for example, that, uh, um, for, for example, bypasses kernel mode in, in, in Linux for, to, to, to provide lower latency for HFT, uh, for example, market. It has default constructor, it has copy constructor. And it turns out that sometimes in copy constructor, an exception is being thrown. And you have socket. Socket is a variant of basic socket and fast socket. And you have function process. Process takes socket, it establishes connections based on our previous functions that we analyzed, and then prints that we are trying to set a socket to a fast one. If it succeeds, then great. But if this exception is being thrown, then we are ending up in a values by exception state. So you have to handle that. In our main application, we have socket, we have process, and we have to catch an exception. If after the exception is being caught, uh, our socket is in a valueless by exception state, we have to set a valid state again before continuing the application. Right? We are setting basic socket again because the fast socket fails to, to, to be constructed. And this is a compromise. This is a decent compromise of a stood variant in, in, in the standard library. It was really hard choice for the designers, for the ICC products committee. As I said, entire standard library provides strong exception safety guarantee. It was really hard to accept an utility that does otherwise. There is a solution. There is a solution that does it in a, with a strong exception safety guarantee, but it also has some trade-offs. This solution is provided, for example, by boost variant. Boost variant provides never empty guarantee. In cases of potentially throwing copy construction, the boost variant will copy construct the content of the left hand side to the heap as a backup. So you have the name memory allocation and the copy. Then it destroys the content on the left hand side. So in the in-place memory of variant, copy construct the content of, on the right-hand side 
Um, and then, in the event of failure, so if this copy fails, then backup is being restored to the left-hand side storage. So you, are, so, so you are reverting what you stored in backup if the new type was failing, well, failed to construct. In the event of success, so if the new type uh, didn't fail to, to, to create, we are deallocating the data pointed to by backup. So we are getting rid of the backup uh, memory that we, that we created. Thanks to this, we have a strong acceptability guarantee, but with potential cost of a dynamic memory allocation. Moreover, boost variant does not provide allocator support, so you don't have any control over how this allocation happens. And now, it is time to make a choice for you. How would you choose? Which of, the, of those solutions would you choose for the standard library? Are we going to go with the stud variant that we have right now in the standard library that provides only basic exception safety guarantee? So there is possibility of invalid state that you have to check after exception is being caught. And maybe we need to do some manual cleanup if needed. But it never allocates memory, right? It's fast, can be easily used in an embedded or constrained environment. Or maybe you'd prefer to go with boost variant. It gives a strong exception safety guarantee. There are no invalid states, no need for manual cleanup, but it allocates memory. So it's slow, it may fail. There's no allocator support, so you have no control how it's being allocated. And some projects will never use it. Embedded, safety critical, hard real time, where basically the memory allocation is not allowed. How would you choose? Which one is a better choice? Which one is a better compromise? Because as you see, there is no golden bullet here. I'm looking here to the results of the poll. Maybe I will give you like 30 seconds more because I know that there is a delay on the internet between uh, my video recording and the, the time you can actually hear it. So maybe let's wait a bit more and let's see. For now, I see that most of the people prefer the standard solution. It's 80% for the standard solution, 20% for boost variant. So people prefer to have only basic accessibility guarantee, but not have the memory allocation cost. This is interesting, but it also is encouraging. It means that the standard committee make a right choice. Let's wait a bit more and see uh, if the poll hum changes. I see that actually it tries to even more bend towards the standard solution. Nearly 90% of people right now chose the standard one. OK. I don't see much more votes coming in, so maybe let's close this poll and continue then. Next, we are going to uh, we are going to talk about uh, my library. It's called MP Units, and I would like to share with you two design problems I actually encountered during uh, the, the designing of my library. And still, I didn't find the best solution here, so I didn't make a choice. So I have some time to get to make the choice. I have some time to get uh, feedback from the users. And I would also like to ask you to provide this feedback for me. What do you think is the best solution for the problem I will describe? First, let's talk about quantity creation helpers. But first, we have to talk about what is a quantity. Quantity, according to the ISO 80,000, uh, um, specification is a property of a phenomenon, body or substance, where the property has a magnitude that can be expressed by means of a number and a reference. A reference can be a measurement unit, for example. So an example of quantity is 
123 kilometers of length, or 70 kilometers per hour of speed. This is a quantity, an amount, and the reference, kilometers of length, right? Quantity class template looks as follows. It's a class template that has three template parameters. All of them are constrained with concepts, C20 concepts. First parameter is a dimension. Second one is a unit of this dimension. And the third one is a representation. It's really similar to stud chrono duration, if you're familiar with this type, right? But stud chrono duration has only the ratio and representation. It doesn't have to deal with dimensions. And ratio is similar to our unit. If you want to instantiate this class template to have a quantity in your code, you have to write this long um, type in, in, in the in your code. Quantity of dimension length with unit kilometer. Quantity of dimension speed with kilometer per hour and integer if you don't want to use the double as a default representation. Um, even though it's really nice and, and really powerful, it's quite verbose to type, and I don't think that people will like to type so much. That's why, with, together with the library, I would like to provide some helpers to improve the user experience in, during the creation of those quantities. And we are going to analyze three different ways of providing helpers. Actually, four of them, four solutions. First of them is pretty simple. I, I call them dimension-specific aliases. It means that for every dimension, like, like length, speed, time, uh, mass, I provide an alias, um, alias template, that fixes the dimension part of the quantity and leaves the unit the representation to be provided by the user, with double being the default. And I call it length or I call it speed in this case, right? So the uh, it has to be provided for every dimension. There are not so many dimensions, so this is not a big problem, for example, for standardization effort for, or for implementation effort or documentation effort, because there are not so many dimensions. An example of uses this is quite nice. I'm saying that I'm using the length of SI system with, with the unit of kilometer from SI system and I provide the value. Or I'm using speed with kilometer per hour, and I want to use integer. It's already a nice improvement over the original quantity type. Still a bit verbose, but actually it contains all of the information that we could actually expect from this code. So this is solution one. It is cheap to standardize, only one per dimension. It's fast to compile because alias templates are actually the fastest one to compile from, the, from all of the templates. And it works both for literals and regular variables, right? If I put here something like uh, ABC as a variable name, it will work as well. Cons? It's still quite verbose to type. For example, the namespace has to be repeated for a unit, right? SI length, SI kilometer because kilometer and length are defined in the same namespace, and uh, they have to be repeated. Actually, I already included here two namespaces with, with using declaration. Uh, I already provided here uh, the units, colon, colon, ISQ, which means uh, interna international standard of quantities. So two namespaces are already taken out from the string, because otherwise it will, it will be units, ISQ, SI, units, ISQ, SI, which gets a bit verbose. Um, another problem for, for someone may be that class temporary argument deduction that was introduced for in C20 for alias templates will not work in this case. So I have to provide this representation by hand. It cannot be deduced from the initializer. This is the solution number one. Let's see the solution number two. Uh, the solution number two is called unit-specific aliases. It's similar to the previous one, but this one defines aliases for every uh, unit for uh, of every dimension in the library. So it's much much more uh, aliases provided, 
And for in order for it to be easy to, to work with them, I had to provide additional namespaces. Right now, length is a namespace, not a class like it was before or an alias. There is a namespace length that has all of the units of length. Actually, it's not a unit, it's a, it's a quantity instance for kilometers. So it fixes not only the dimension, but also fixes the unit in the alias and on the representation type with the default of the double is left to users to provide. I have to provide it for length for speed to show you the solution on the next slide. So here it is. As I said, there are some additional namespaces uh, that, that are used here, but the solution looks as follows. SI length of kilometers, and I'm using already the shortcut notation of it, right? I'm not writing kilometers or kilometers per hour like it was here, a long one, but I'm using the symbolic version of those units. So it's much shorter, and I don't have to repeat the namespace for the, for the unit itself. Moreover, it works nicely with C++20 class template argument deduction for alias templates. So if I skip this initializer of, of template here, I have here the um, only um, the uh, name of the class template, of the, of the alias template here. Then the representation type will be deduced. So this will be double, and this will be integer. Moreover, I can decide to be terse if desired. If I know that kilometer is a unit of length, I can actually provide more namespaces here in a using declaration. And then um, use only the namespace, the, the, the unit name here. Kilometer, meter, second, hour, whatever, right? And it looks quite similar to what we have in um, SI chrono duration with um, the user-defined literals, right? Different syntax, but still really terse. So the good part of this solution, it's fast to compile because those are alias templates. They work both for literal and regular variables, because still I can provide ABC here instead of 70 and it will work fine. Uh, user can choose to either use a long or terse version. Depends on, on your context. You can use either this one or this one. However, it's quite expensive to standardize, right? Every unit of every dimension uh, has to have this uh, definition provided. And we are going to solution number three. It's called quantity references. Quantity references are global variables defined in specific namespaces. Uh, this is another type called reference, and it stores information that is a reference of dimension length and kilometer, and it's called km. This is an object called km, right? Global object like here or here. And then I put in all of those references to the references namespace if someone would like to include everything at once. Why I actually have to spread it to those references is because of problems with, with shadowing. There are a lot of units in, for example, SI system. Uh, many of them have like one or two letter uh, symbols, H, T, N, and so on. And it happens that those objects shadow variables that you use in your code sometimes. That's why sometimes you can selectively say, I just want time references, not everything from the SI system. And this is how you use them. You take the value and multiply by specific reference. You can also create References from other references. You can say kilometers divided by hour provides you kilometer per hour reference, and then it's being multiplied with the value here. 
And those this parenthesis is required here because um, the only operation allowed is number times the uh, reference. You cannot multiply quantity with reference because uh, it will be even harder to uh, to work with. However, what is really nice here is that you can easily define your custom references for your own types. For example, I can specify that this is that, and I just created a global variable for kilometer per hour. And now I can just type this one instead of this one. And I don't need to provide any other logic here. I don't have to instantiate any class templates. I don't have to, to deal with the library features. I just do arithmetic operation, store the result, and use it. It's really convenient. It's medium effort to standardize because it's provided for only, only for named, named units, uh, as those has to be provided by you if you like. So it's there are not so many named units in the standard in the in the SI system, for example. It work, works both again for literals and regular variables. It's easy to compose. Uh, uh, custom references if needed. However, it's a, it's slower to compile uh, because uh, those are not aliases but class template instantiations. Sometimes it's awkward to type. As I said this uh, because of the operator's precedence, you have to type those parentheses. And if you want to divide it by 10 milliseconds squared, even more, more, more parentheses has to be provided. Objects with short names often shadow users' local variables, like meter, tone, newton, overwrite what you have in your code already, and then the compiler complains. Sometimes also it may be hard to understand. For example, I have a variable speed with two arguments, d and t, for, your, for distance and time, and I multiply it by meter and second. Right, right? it tends to be pretty cryptic. It's easy to understand when those are numbers, like 20 times meter looks nice, but d times meter tends to be harder to understand. It may be two thirds, actually. And the last one, the last one that you should be familiar with, because this is a solution from std chrono duration. We have user-defined literals. User defined literals that are provided for uh, for every quantity of every unit with two different versions for integral values and for floating point values. Um, language C++ language only allows us to provide those for unsigned long long and long double. So with user defined literals, you are not able to create, for example, float value or int value. You always end up with those really big long types which is already a disadvantage here. Moreover, there are a lot of definitions to provide because you have to provide two definitions for every unit in the library. The code, on the other hand, looks quite nice. This Q underscore is for quantity, quantity in kilometer, quantity in kilometer per hour. I had to introduce this prefix because otherwise uh, it will not work for some units because they collide with already provided literals in the compiler extensions for, for example, some mathematical types. We had some collisions and, 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 and they cannot be easily solved. That's why I have to provide Q underscore here to disambiguate it from already existing literals in the, in the compilers. Pros, this is what we know and already use, right? They are terse ter and easy to understand. However, they are the slowest to compile because there are, there are so many definitions out there. The most expected to standardize because there are so many definitions out there. And it works only for literals, not for common variables, right? I cannot specify ABC Q kilometer here. It has to be a compile time known number here in order to make it work. So I cannot use uh, variables. And compile time numbers actually are, from my experience, are used only for two different stuff, either for constants, like like physical constants, like uh, the uh, acceleration of the of, of the of the Earth, for example, or for unit tests, where actually you test a lot and you use use numbers 
and, and you, want, you want to use UDLs in order to, to make the um, class construction simpler. But in production code, you use uh, numbers rarely, you use variables there, and then user defined literals are useless. As I said, there is no control over the representation type, right? You can either end up with this or this. You cannot have anything smaller. Moreover, there's a problem that um, if you have in two different namespaces the same UDL, you cannot disambiguate the UDL to, to say from which namespace you want to use. For example, SI system and CGA system, both of them provide centimeter. And if you will in class both namespaces, you will not be able to use uh, UDLs anymore for, for, for this unit. Of course, I could try to standardize everything, right? Because already all of them are implemented in the library. I could try to say, go to committee and say, let's get it all. Because there is a useful stuff if in every solution here. But it requires time. It requires time to discuss in the working group. It, pre um, it requires time to prepare the ISO specification. It requires time, time to implement. It also requires time for you to learn it, right? And it also makes it harder to uh, basically to maintain, to analyze, to, to work with, because there are so many ways to do the same. That's why we have to choose something. Uh, I just got a quick comment that, uh, yeah, this is right, that, that for this, we could write something like ABC times one Q kilometer, and it will work. Um, and this is, this, is an, this is a solution here. If you would like to to use uh, the variables uh, with with those UDLs, and yeah, this may be a workaround, but it's not a native solution. Uh, but really, really good comment. Thank you. Okay, so let's compare all of those solutions. So you can start to be ready with your choice for another poll. This is solution one. Dimension aliases, right? You have dimension and a unit and potentially a representation. Quite long, but easy to standardize and fast to compile. Unit aliases, where you have aliases for every unit and then dimension is, an, is a namespace. You can either have this version or a third version, if you so desire. Or quantity references that use this multiply syntax they can easily be used to, uh, to create a temporary um, or, or your custom uh, references. They are, they are defined only for named units, so not that much effort to standardize. And it's quite convenient to use. And UDLs. And now it's your choice. I have the list of all of, all of the benefits here and, and, and issues. Uh, basically, what's uh, blue and, and bold font here, I deem that it's a, it's a good side of the solution. And if it's black and, 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 and regular font, then, then basically it's a, it's a worse part of, the, of this feature. Even though it seems that Unity Aliases has the, the most of the blue parts, it still has three black parts. And that's not that obvious choice to me, that this, this is the best solution. So this is up to you right now. Please try to make find the best solution. Uh, in the meantime, I got a question from Klaus uh, that uh, some of you asked uh, what I mean by slow to compile. Could I put some numbers on slow? Uh, from my uh, measurements of, of compile times, it turns out that, uh, for example, unit aliases are the fastest to compile. References are from three to five times slower, and UDLs are three to, the, to five times slower than, than references. I didn't measure the dimension aliases by, by myself, but it should be the fastest one. Basically, I use dimension aliases to implement the rest of them right now. So, so that's why I never disabled them in my code. But the library is, is, is designed in such a way that you can, uh, you can selectively disable two, three, or four, depending on your choice. You can also disable all of them if you want to have the fastest compile times and not use those features. 
By default, all of them are enabled, but you can opt out from them if you require. And compare, for example, compile times. OK, let's look into the uh, current situation on our poll. It seems that right now the winner is quantity references. We have 47% of people stating that this is the best solution. Uh, so this multiply syntax, uh, multiply syntax uh, version has the most funds right now. Yeah, I really like it. Actually, all of the documentation on our website is written in terms of this solution because we find it really attractive. The second one that I see here is unit aliases. Right now it has a rough, around 25% of votes. And yeah, this is an, a, a good solution as well. As I said, this is probably this has the most of the blue text here. And the least liked one are UDLs, the one that we have in Chrono. And uh, I tend to agree with, it, with this. And it seems that maybe what we have in Chrono is not the best solution. And maybe we should think about uh, adding some new stuff to Chrono when this library will be part of standard in order to be com consistent with this library and to provide better solutions to users. And dimension aliases are pretty on par with UDLs. There's a question if there is a path from one choice to another. I don't know what you mean a path, but, but if we will uh, basically specify one of them, uh, then the other, they are totally different solutions. There is not like, like you can easily uh, reuse stuff. Only the dimension aliases are the ones that I reuse for, to implement those others. But actually, dimension aliases can also be removed from the library, and I can just live with the quantity template in order to specify the rest. So all of them are separate solutions. All of them can work together if needed, because this is what is in the default state of my library. But on the other hand, as I said, it's it's expensive to standardize, and probably no one will agree to have all of them in the in the standard library. And there is another uh, interesting comment that we could, for example, implement the solution number one in C plus plus twenty six, and then follow up with three in C plus plus twenty nine. It is possible. Actually, I don't expect that entire library will happen in C plus plus twenty twenty six. I expect that I will have to write like 10 different papers for this only one library, just spreading it to, to smaller parts and trying to, to push or, or move all of those uh, parts separately through the IC committee. I expect some of them to be more popular, some of them to be less popular or, and, and controversial. So probably some of those will either be declined by the, uh, by the committee or some of them uh, basically will have to wait and get more mature and wait for the next revision of the standard. Actually, I hoped for C++23 at some point, but due to COVID and our lack of meetings, and also because uh, the implementation here architecture takes time, I think that waiting for C++26 in order to have a major solution is a better choice here. OK, so it seems we have a winner. It's quantity references, number three. Thank you very much for your input. And let's continue to the last problem of today's evening. The done casting facility. I don't know if you attended my talks on different conferences or watched them on, on, on YouTube, but uh, I spoke about this facility quite a lot because it's quite impressive. This is what it does. If I have a function average speed that takes a distance and a time, and I divide it, store the result at SS, I can print it and return it. Right? And this is how I run it. 140 kilometers, two hours. And this is what's printed on the screen. It's 70 kilometers per hour. This speed is already known to be a speed dimension with kilometer per hour unit. Moreover, it's not only about putting something on a console. Also, if you see a comp compiler lock, a compiler error lock, or a, or a breakpoint in, in, in the debugger, 
you will see that the type S is a quantity of dim speed and unit of kilometer per hour, even though it was constructed from other types, from the type of, of length and the type of time. How is it possible? Because the engine by itself doesn't know it. The engine knows that, that, that it constructs some quantity where, where the length is an exponent one and time is an exponent minus one. By default, it doesn't know that the user created a type called speed that matches those exponents. I had to teach it uh, to our uh, engine. First implementation I created was based on simple traits. This trait by default was a type identity. So if I provided something, it returned something. And the engine just was getting the type from this type type trait. But for each and every uh, dimension and unit, I provided the specialization of the Duncan's trait, saying that uh, this is the dimension speed definition. This is direct dimension of exponent length one, exponent time minus one. And every time, dear framework, if you see such a type, please return such type to the user. Right? This is mapping of types from this to this. And the same for ARIA, the same for every other derived dimension. It was um, really tedious, really uh, verbose to, 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 to basically to implement. Also would be really verbose to specify and standardize because for every definition, you have to provide specialization of a trait. But uh, later on, together with Richard, Richard Smith, we ended up with the current solution with version 2.0. This is how it's done right now in the compiler, in the library. We have derived dimension of dim length and dim time, and we inherit dim speed from this type. This is how it's defined, right? This is here. It's inherited from this type. In order for this framework to work, we are creating new types and injecting into this hierarchy. We are creating something called downcast base for this type and downcast child that takes this type and the type that uh, this type and the type that that uh, basically must be provided as a result. Right? So this is what engine creates, the right dimension. This is what user provides. And we injected two classes one as a base and one as a child that, pro that provides the information about the mapping between direct dimension and speed. And this is how it's implemented. Duncast base uh, has an alias, sorry, a, a, a type here, Duncast base type that basically is its, its type to provide it here and a declaration of a friend function. Duncast guide for this base class. There's no implementation here, and it returns auto. Then we have Duncast table concept that requires type T to have Duncast base type, so this one, right? And we expect that our type T is derived from the Duncast base of T Duncast base type. So it's derived from this type. And then we have Duncast child. Duncast child is basically the curiosity recurring template pattern. It gets the type here, and, and, and then it, sorry, it's not curiosity recurring template pattern, <laughs> not in this case. It, it is, but, but, but uh, somewhere in the library, but not on the slide. Uh, it, it, it takes the type T and inherits from times type T, right? So this is the second parameter here, this uh, derived dimension. It inherits from derived dimension, and this is the type provided here. This is the CRTP target. And this Duncast child implements 
the function declared here. Because only in this place, we know what the target is. We know that this is dimension speed. And only here, we can return this type. And this is why we provided this auto here, but because the information about the return type is known only here. But the library by itself can call only this class. And here we don't know about the destination. So we have a down class facility that basically checks if there is a down class guide provided. It gets the type and returns it, otherwise it returns type T. And everything works great, but there should be some problem, right? Because we said well, there is no golden bullets in our slides today. So there is one problem here. This problem is called one definition rule. One definition rule uh, is, is the rule of the language. It's defined for two different scopes for translation unit, saying that, on one, on, that only one definition of any variable, function, class type, enumeration, concept, or template is allowed in any one translation unit. So this is simple. In one translation unit, there can be only one definition. And this is actually why we provide those header guards, right? For all of our headers. So if header is included more than once in the translation unit, the other in inclusions are disabled. So there is no repeating of definitions in the same translation unit because otherwise the code would not compile. And there is another scope for one definition rule called program. And this is pretty similar. One and only one definition of every non-inline function or variable is required to appear in the entire program. If the function or variable is inline, it has to be provided in every translation unit that basically use it. And something similar to classes. One and only one definition of class is required to appear in any translation unit that basically uses it. <coughs> but it wouldn't be C++ if there was no exceptions from the rule, right? There is a C++. So there is a but. But there can be more than one definition in a program, as long as each definition appears in different translation unit, because in the same translation unit, you already stated that there cannot be any repeat of a definition, right? And each definition consists of the same sequence of tokens. It, notice that it has to be even the same sequence of tokens, not equivalent implementation. And there are some additional rules, but they are not that important here. If all of these requirements are satisfied, even if there is a duplicated definition, the program behaves as if there is only one of the definitions in the entire program. Otherwise, the behavior is undefined. So let's see how this program how this problem affects our domestic utility. Let's have a header called average speed. It has average speed, it has length, it takes time, it returns speed. It calculates speed, dividing distance by time, prints speed, and returns the speed. And now we have translation unit one, some function one that includes a variable speed, includes the speed definition in the library, and calls this function. The result on the, out, on the, on the console will be 70 km per hour, as we've seen already, right? But now there is another file that also calls a variable speed with exactly the same argument, but didn't include speed definition. So the library doesn't know how to map this direct dimension type to dimension speed because there is no definition in, in provided, right? So we end up with something like this. And it's not, it's not only about the, about the output on the console, also types that are deduced here are different. And the type returned from here to here is different. And this is one definition rule violation. Of course, there's nothing new in the C++ language, right? There are a lot of customization points that behave the same. For example, let's have header AB that's, that defines structure A, structure B. Structure A say have some value, B have value and a pointer to A, and you have some, out, some streaming operator in order to, to print it. And you have file one that in class this header defines swap on Bs. But it defines swap on Bs that it only swaps 
this value, not A. We create A's, we create B's, we do range swap to swap them, and then print it. And the result is that first elements were swapped as expected, second elements were not swapped as expected. But then we have second transition unit that doesn't provide the swap definition and does exactly the same. Calls range swap with the same arguments, get different result because customization point is not visible for swap in this translation unit. This is something that we only always had in the language. So maybe it's not that bad, but for sure it is not great. This is for swap. Swap is one of the, of the customization points, but there are many others, and most of them actually will not compile if the customization point is not provided. For example, let's get rid of the streaming operator, right? Or let's get, let's get rid of less than operator or equality comparator and provide this to some, to, to some uh, container. The code will just not compile, stating that there is no definition for streaming operator. Swap is different in those means that swap by default provides some implementation. So it compiles for every type. Comparison with less than equals or streaming operator will not have the default implementation for your type. That's why the compiler will refuse to compile the code. So you will find the error and you will be able to fix it. But with swap or my casting facility, the code will compile fine, but behave differently in different translation units. So we have three different solutions here. We can keep it as it is right now. So we get speed when such definition is included by the user. Otherwise, if it's not defined by the user, this strange type is returned. Unknown dimension of exponent length one, exponent time minus one. We can document this fact. So every user knows that it has to, um, basically the such feature exists, that there it has some constraints and that, that basically the same physical system definition, so the same set of header files, has to be included in all translation units in your application. Hopefully, C++ modules will help here because we can, for example, not allow to have uh, headers that are separate for, for speed, for length, for time. We can just provide one module that's pre-compiled and is called SI. And then this problem should be limited. But still, for example, someone may provide, uh, in one transition unit, may use SI and CGS, and, and in the second one, you may use only SI and have different results as well. Solution number two. Um, actually, we can maybe start the poll if we can. Then, then, then already some people can start voting, as we have descriptions here. And uh, solution number two is to provide compile time error when basically calculation results with a dimension that is undefined. Right, the same as lacking streaming operator, lacking less than, lacking equality comparator. So it means that I will not have support for unknown dimension. It will not be provided. If it's not known, it will be a compile time error every time. So everything will have to be predefined, even if it is just some partial result of some arithmetic calculation that in the end will result in a known dimension unit. For example, I have velocity here, 160 kilometers per hour. I have some sync rate in meters per second. I can calculate some um, square root of this one and this one and add it. This won't compile because this will end up with some unknown dimension. It will be unit like kilometer squared, meter squared, and even stranger one for, for, the, um, for the acceleration. Sorry, for, this is not acceleration, but for, this, this will be meter, meter squared, second squared. Right? So this will not compile. And even this will not compile if it's done in, in the same line, because this again will end up in an undefined unit. And solution? Yeah, so I think that this may constrain the library a bit too much, because P++ 
people will like to have temporary results that are undefined dimension and then end up with a defined one at the end. And solution three, get rid of the done casting facility at all, remove it. And the user should be responsible for providing a specific type. So if you type something like this and assign this to auto, then it will end up with some unknown dimension type. And printing this on the console will print some garbage. And also it will be long to, to, to see it in the debugger or the, or the compiler error log. But then it can be implicitly assigned to a strong type provided by the user. And printing of the strong type will be done correctly. And of course, the strong type will appear correctly in the error logs and debugger. And also, removing the functional facility simplifies the standardization effort. So maybe there is some good size of it. However, some code will not be possible to run. For example, the code that we analyzed will not run as expected because there is no possibility to provide a strong type for this type. You should either split it to two different functions, one that maybe does the calculation and then cast the type and then, and then prints it in another function. Or maybe we should make this function a template uh, that will take this target type as an, as an option here. But then the user has to provide it rather than it's automatically deduced from the arguments of the function. So you have to remember that this unit is in kilometers, this is in, in, in hours, so this speed should be in kilometers per hour, not in miles per hour, for example. And as I said, this is not only about printing, this is also affecting uh, compilation errors, debugging experience, and so on. So we have a poll. We have three options. Keep it as it is, number one. Number two, compile time error when resulting dimensions or unit is undefined, or free get rid of the done-casting facility at all. In the meantime, I have some questions here. Uh, can we have the module-based solution without modules and by basically putting the entire SI library in a single header? Yes, there is a header like this one. It aggregates all of other headers, but it takes a minute to compile right now. If you are including this in every translation unit, it takes a lot of time. I thought that maybe um, pre-compiled headers will help here, but they didn't, at least for me. Modules should be better because modules should compile once and then reuse, right? All of those instantiations, all of those quantity, quantity helpers take time to, to process during compile times. But then, as a user, you should have everything already set up for you, for, for you. So, so it should be really fast for, to compile your code when the module is being imported. So this library was created from scratch with modules in mind. And I hope that soon, when CMake starts to support them, we'll be able to, to, to introduce modules to the library, and then you'll be able to benefit from them. And there is also, uh, okay, there is also another question. I will just answer this quickly because I see the result of the poll already, but I will keep you in, uh, in the dark for a moment and will not share the solution, but I will ask another question. What do you think about having the SI library as a TS? Will it be easier to get throttle in the committee? Maybe TS can contain several helpers and we can learn what people use before we standardize. Well, uh, we can do the TS. Of course we can do, do one, but from my experience, TSs are never implemented by, by compiler vendors or nearly never, right? Networking, the networking TS was implemented probably only by, uh, by Visual Studio, I think, if I'm not wrong. So anyway, people will have to go to my library on GitHub and use it, so we can actually test it without having the TS. Please go there and test it right now, right? That's why I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm talking about this on conferences. Uh, so uh, I think that that's, that's the best solution. Um, maybe the better one would be to include this in Boost as an alternative. But Boost has having some tough times lately. Uh, and I don't think that Boost is what it was like 20 years ago or 15 years ago. So it's a hard choice. It's good that I saw actually the results of the, of the poll because it disappeared for me. 
<laughs> I don't know if if Andreas can 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 make it uh, provide it again. But I think that the the the, uh, re- the answer was that keep it as it is. I don't remember exactly what was the percentage. Uh, however, uh, maybe someone can can share it <laughs> again with me. If not, then uh, I will. I think that rest, yeah, keep it as it is was 67 percent. So, so people like the casting facility. They want to experiment with it, and they don't. They are not afraid of of one definition rule violation. Get rid was 33 percent, and compile time error didn't have any any people that uh, that didn't like it. So yes. Uh, Two times more people want to have dynamic dundon cost facility, but also one third has some opposition to it. So consider now I'm we going to the standard committee room and trying to convince everyone that this is the best solution. It will be quite hard. So um, yeah, uh, that's it what I had to, today to share with you. As you can see, designing is hard. Uh, Different customers have various expectations, experience, constraints on what they want to, um, to get to achieve. Often, there is no golden bullet to the solution, to the problem. Uh, there is a need to choose from several, but suboptimal solutions. C++ standardization takes time and resources. So that's why early adopters and feedback are always welcome to my library and to other libraries. Please go and try and use linear algebra. Please try and go and use physical units library. Please try and use any other library that's meant to be standardized soon in the committee. Provide feedback to the authors. So the solution we will get in the, in the future is the best we can get. And that we'll be able to get requirements and feedback from every stakeholder that is interested in this. <laughs> and the last one, naming is hard. So please help. And that's all I had for today. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot for the great talk. So I think we don't have any outstanding questions. So if you do have questions, still questions, please uh, post them in the chat so that Matush can answer them right now. But of course, if you, no, this was a thanks. Um, but if you do have questions that you would like to discuss with Matush person, personally, then you are now cordially invited to our after talk chat. So allow me to directly post the link to our Zoom meeting. That now should allow you to um, go to Zoom directly and then we can discuss all kinds of things. Yeah? Uh, things about this uh, this library, things about design decisions in in uh, in total, but you can also just chat about C++. All right. So I don't see any other questions. So thanks again, Matush. This was great. And I definitely hope that you have an, enough time for the uh, the after talk chat. Yeah, I will go to the uh, to, 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 to the chat after the talk, and I hope that I was able to stand up up to up to, up to your expectations with the talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you. So then I thank do you. hope that I see as many of you as possible in the after talk chat. Else, have a great evening, and see you next time.